This is Mallory Wood, Director of Marketing at M. Stoner, and we have Mayan Plout here as well. Mayan, do you want to say hi? Hello. Hello. We are so excited to welcome you to today's webinar, Forwarding the Social Media Channel. And we just want to make sure that you can actually hear us, because that usually helps when you're in a webinar that you can hear the people presenting. So just tweet us, use the hashtag Ford the River or shoot, uh, use the hand raise function in the control panel um, if the audio is coming through loud and clear. And I'm just going to wait to make sure people can hear us. Oh, perfect. All right, thank you everyone for raising your hand and tweeting, appreciate it. All right, so let's get through a few housekeeping items before we jump into the webinar. First of all, as always, today's webinar will be recorded. It is recording, and assuming technology loves us today, it will be made available to you via email, most likely on Monday. Um, so watch your email for that. You will get a recording of the webinar. Our next webinar is going to be on February 22nd, and it will focus on strategies for small websites. So if you work at a department or a college or school within an institution, this would probably be a really great webinar for you. And sign up information is going to come out on the M. Stoner blog next week, so stay tuned for that. During the webinar today, you can use the chat feature to ask questions as well as the question feature right within the control panel. And we've saved about 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Thank you to all of you who already emailed and tweeted us your questions. So that was great. We've got those queued up. And we also will take questions live during the webinar. Um, and you can do that with the hashtag for the river. So at the end of the webinar, we have something very exciting to share exclusively with those of you who attend. And I want to say we just maxed out this webinar. This is the first webinar M. Stoner's ever maxed out. So this is really exciting. And so we're so thrilled that you all made it in. Um, but those of you who have come in today and stick with, us, stick with us through the entire session, we have something to share exclusively with you. And that's all I'm going to say about it for now. So feel free to guess on Twitter what we might be giving away. Um, but it's a special secret uh, prize, I guess, for those of you who stick with us. And we're really excited about it. So let's get started. Mayan, I'm going to turn Hi. this over to you. Excellent. Um, so I am, sorry about that, Mayan Plout. I'm the social media coordinator at Orwellian College. I graduated from Orwellian in 2010. Uh, as a social media coordinator, I manage all of the high-level social accounts like Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr, and also our homegrown projects, the Oberlin Stories Project and the Oberlin Blogs. Um, I serve as a consultant and strategist and cheerleader for anyone else on campus interested in exploring social media. While I am a full-time social media person, I manage in about an hour a day. Um, as you can see here, I uh, write about my social media adventures and case studies on the Oberlin College web team blog. Um, and in my off time, sometime last year, my housemate and I created a site called Why the <clears throat> Should I Choose Oberlin, which accidentally escalated into a giant love puddle of Oberlin adoration. Um, something that's interesting to know about both Mallory and myself, um, both of our jobs did not have us focus on social media eight hours a day, we actually did it in an hour or less, which means you have to think very big and very small all at the same time. Mallory, who are you? Who am I? That's a good question. Um, as I already mentioned, I'm the director of marketing at M. Stoner, and I have to say I love my job. I get to spend part of my day talking to people like those of you who are attending this webinar about how M. Stoner can help achieve goals in marketing and communications on the web. And then the other half of my day is spent managing Higher Ed Live, ED Universe, the M. Stoner website, and anything that's coming up uh, with 
you know, our new or innovative ways that we might uh, provide resources to the higher ed community. And I often say that one of my favorite things about working at Emstoner is that we have a really great culture of sharing resources and thought leadership. And so I'm, you know, really proud that I can help manage those efforts. Uh, before M. Stoner, I was the assistant director of marketing at St. Michael's College. My role was primarily to manage social media for the institution and particularly the admissions office. Even though social media was a huge piece of my job, my position didn't allow me to focus on social media for eight hours a day, 40 days a week, like my aunt just said. So I too, you know, had to figure out how to manage social media in an hour or less. And that is what inspired us to join up and put this presentation together for you. Yes. So, some things that you can expect in this presentation. Um, we'll let, just let you read all of those things on your own. Um, but our main goal, above all else, is to help you figure out ways for you to do your job more efficiently and in less time. Also, more fluffy things, but we'll get to that later. So. Because games are fun, because games are the hot word of the century, uh, we are going to make this presentation into one. So the first thing we're going to do is turn on our sound. We good? Yes. Excellent. I'm glad you can hear us. Great. Uh, next. So the next thing we're going to do is actually learn a little bit about the trail before we begin. Should we try? I do believe that we can. Um, we are here to help you cross the rivers, to make wise decisions, and to reach the gold in the hills, because in fact that is what we are all after, a return on our investment. We are going to touch upon goal setting, implementation, and measurement right now. So, I think we can all pretty much agree that setting goals is a necessary first step before determining which tools we're going to use or add to the mix. So this is a tweetable moment for those of you on Twitter. Goals come before tools. Always, always, always. So assuming that most of you on this webinar already are using some form of social media, we should also assume that you've written down a few goals. But whether you have or not, these next few slides are ones you should really pay attention to. I am an advocate for setting SMART goals. SMART goals are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. A specific goal, if you think about it, has a much greater chance of being accomplished than a general goal. And it's important to establish concrete criteria for measuring your progress. To be realistic, a goal must represent an objective toward which you're both willing and able to work. And a goal can be both high and realistic, so they're not exclusive of each other. Your goals should also be grounded within a time frame. If you don't have a time frame, your goal will lack a sense of urgency. So while measurement is all good and dandy, you cannot measure everything that you do. Um, I spend a lot of time of my day trying to connect with current students. The return on that is not necessarily something that we can measure beyond making their experience here better. They don't need to reach out to the institution because they're already here. So anything that we can do to make their experience a better thing overall is something that is great. Um, yeah, any kind of involvement on campus, off campus, if we can supplement it online or in person, we will do it. Even if we can't attach a number to it, it is a good thing. So your goals are going to be different from your colleagues on this webinar. We all work at different institutions, different departments. So we each need to determine what's valuable at our institution and measure that. And if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So let's look at an example that I hope is going to resonate with many of you. The goal you see on your screen is use Facebook to impact recruitment. If we were all in a room together, I would ask you to raise your hand if you think this is a SMART goal, and I would hope that no hands go up, because this is not a SMART goal. We haven't given a time frame, we haven't given anything to measure, it's not specific, and so therefore we really can't prove if our efforts have succeeded, if we have actually used Facebook to impact recruitment. The next slide is going to show you how we can make this goal SMART. 
By changing the goal, we have provided details like which class year we are specifically targeting, and we've given a measurable and time-bound goal to attain, which is increasing interaction by 15% before April 1st. So I can hope that you see the, the key differences between these two goals. We're going to have a whole list of measurable objectives, hopefully, that, that we measure when we think about what our goals are. And here's some examples. You know, the point of this webinar is not to overwhelm you with numbers or add 10 new tasks to your day, but it would, you know, it would just really be impossible to measure absolutely everything, and, and you shouldn't do that, but measure the things that matter. Measuring what matters and paying attention will allow you to adjust your tactics if something isn't working, and this means that you'll no longer be tweeting just because everyone else is or posting a photo on Facebook without purpose. If you create and measure your objectives, that will allow you to tie what you're doing with social media to the broader goals of the institution. So I hope this list is useful for you. So the data you see on your screen is from the 2012 Case M. Stoner Slover Lynette Social Media and Advancement Survey. And as you can see, most institutions are measuring really basic things like number of friends, likes, tweets, and comments. Those are easy things to measure, um, and that's what most of us are doing right now. Very few are actually measuring what I consider to be more advanced indicators of success like penetration among target audiences, donations, volume of negative tweets, or application increases. So assuming that uh, we've hoped to convince you that measuring is necessary and doable, you know, I think you'll really be ahead of the curve if you can implement savvy goal setting. So here's a measurement term that I'm sure many are familiar with, ROI or return on investment. I suggest figuring out your return on investment for your key performance indicators or your KPIs. KPIs are quantifiable measurements that you agree to with your boss or whomever at the institution. They will reflect critical success factors of your institution and uh, the key to a KPI is that they're quantifiable and they reflect the institution goals. So let's walk through an example that will show you how you can determine the worth of your Facebook followers. After two months in this hypothetical situation, you have gained 500 new likes on Facebook and you spent about five minutes a day during those two months posting, listening, and managing your Facebook page. So that equals 310 minutes. You also know what you earn. You earn an annual salary of $45,000, and if you break that out all the way down to your uh, salary per minute, that is $0.36 cents per minute. Um, so a side note to this example, if this fictitious person was listening to this webinar, they would be spending $21.60 to be with Mayan and I today. So all I have to say is we really appreciate that. Uh, but with this information, that's very easy to figure out, you can determine your cost per follower on Facebook. So we've, we're going to plug these numbers into our gains minus cost, cost formula, which is what we've done. The gain was 500 followers. The cost was 310 minutes times 36 cents a minute. And then you divide it by your cost. So therefore, our cost per follower is $3.48. Now, we don't know if this is good or bad. This is just a hypothetical situation, and we have nothing to compare that number to. We would have to compare that number to our cost per follower uh, dollar amount for other equivalent time periods. So perhaps this first calculation might become your benchmark uh, if you were doing this um, this exercise. Either way, you've just established your first KPI and that will help you evaluate your future success. I personally uh, like to calculate goals on a quarterly basis at M Stoner. I find that that's a really good timeline and I 
you know, I just find that that works really well, so that would be my suggestion. Throughout the rest of this webinar, uh, we'll be sharing case studies that are going to highlight points that Mayan and I are making, and you'll see that they'll always come back to goal setting. So our first case study is a really great example of how one institution set a SMART goal and achieved it. This case study is going to be published for the first time next month in M. Stoner's book titled Social Works, How Higher Ed Uses Social Media to Raise Money, Build Awareness, Recruit Students, and Get Results. So uh, Mayan is going to tweet out a link to that. And in this, in this example, Chad Warren, who was, uh, is FSC's Director of Annual Giving, he and his team uh, kept things pretty simple. They announced a goal, raise $161,000 to celebrate the school's 161st anniversary in 36 hours on January 23rd and 24th. Now, if that's not a SMART goal, I don't know what is, because that has all the elements that we're looking for. FSU spent less than $10,000 on advertising and promotion for this campaign, and most of the promotion was done through social channels to engage supporters and build the excitement. They also enlisted and trained students to help connect with other students and donors. Warren's team prepared prepackaged updates for each social media network and delivered them to their online ambassadors via email. We're going to flip slides so you can actually see what that website looked like. And uh, for example, I mentioned that th those prepackaged updates, they prepared updates for Twitter that were less than 140 characters, that included links, they prepared messages for online ambassadors to share on Facebook. So the campaign did exceed their goals. They raised more than $186,000 and actually even introduced nearly 300 new donors to the university. And the next slide has one of my favorite quotes from Daniel Kruger, who said, the best thing we could do was reach out to members where they were and how they were communicating. So, Numbers, yes. Numbers actually make me really excited, even though they're slightly overwhelming at times. So at this point, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling pumped up. I hope that all of you feel the same. So now, we have our basics. It is about time to travel the trail. So we have to decide what kind of person we are. Just for me, I'm going to decide that we are a carpenter from Ohio. Not just because I'm from Ohio and I'm living here now working at Oberlin College, but it is because what we are doing is that we are building something new. We are making sure that the framework is sturdy, we have ideas, and we need tools to make what we're doing work. So, who is doing this thing? Uh, is it me alone, or is it me with other people? The answer is, it is you, but it is also the rest of your team, your wagon party, who are really important to making sure that what you do actually happens. Your team is incredibly important. It is not just your other social media folks who happen to be in the same wagon as you around the school, but it is the folks that you work with every single day. They are your informers, they are your idea bouncers, and your advocates, and you should always keep them close to you. On a grander scheme of things, you are part of the wagon party. This is the group that you're traveling with. You protect each other and help each other out along the way. So, who are your informers? Um, I'm just going to say it straight out. Make it stupidly easy for your audience to know who they should be talking to. Who are the informers and how do we reach them? The most important tool in your box for me is that your network of people can feed you information. Um, there are a couple ways to do this. Developing a campus culture where the stories are fed to you is a great one, but it takes a lot of frameworks and building and isn't something that you can just plop into place. It's something that takes time. Um, I know that there are a couple social media user groups actually watching this webinar today, and that is an excellent example of um, a network that can feed you and solicit information. Uh, I'm not sure how the groups who are watching us today are doing it, but uh, email chains, Facebook accounts to keep people together, monthly newsletters, any sort of in-person check-ins, um, all of those things are ways that you can make sure your information is getting to the right people. So. How do your informers get to you? Online, you can make your channels apparent, transparent, and accessible. 
I state that I manage all of my account, all of the Oberlin accounts. Um, my name is on it. It's great. Um, and it also has my contact information. So if anyone wants to get in touch me, with me for whatever reason, high fives, critiques, questions, whatever, they can do so. Every single channel that we have and that is managed by Oberlin College has some sort of feedback loop. So offline is very much the same. Um, and this is actually where I get to have a lot of fun with this. Offline means that you get to go out anywhere on campus or off campus and show your face in the name of your social media. Um, so I actually do something that I like to call social media office hours. Um, I buy a bunch of candy, I set myself up in a public place, and people will come and talk to me. Or they just come because they want candy and then we talk about it anyways. So part of my goal for 2015 is to be a human. Um, going offline and talking to people in person totally falls in line with that. So in both these cases, online, offline, the world is the world wherever we are. Be willing to talk to people, be willing to direct people to the right place, and be willing to connect. So this case study is uh, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And this is a really awesome, seriously awesome campaign. Uh, hashtag UW Right Now uh, was a multimedia project designed to capture the breadth depth and spirit of the university during a 24-hour period. So um, I would say this is social media informers on steroids. The entire campus community plus alumni and friends from pretty much around the world were invited to share their thoughts about what makes the institution a special place. I mean that's pretty simple. The campaign was guided by four goals. So as you can see, we are going to connect back to goal setting here. And these goals helped to ensure the campaign's broad reach, engagement, and success. So here are the goals. First, showcase the pride and excitement the community has about its relationship to UW-Madison. Two, engage the broad UW community, give them a voice by offering the chance to submit content. Three, Challenge university communication staff to explore new creative, technical, and content solutions to communication. And four, connect with and encourage campus partners to submit high quality stories from their own programs. So this next screen is actually a, a shot of the website. I think it's beautifully designed so interesting. You can see we're looking at the 3 p.m. time slot, and this uh, is a mixed blend of the crowdsourced tweets, photos, and video uh, with staff-produced coverage. Uh, and they were all posted to this site, and you could sort it by hour, so you could see just when people were um, sending in their submissions. Let's look at some of the results. The university communications staff wanted content that they could repurpose that would have a shelf life, and they wanted stories that could be used by the admission office, by staff who manages campus tours, by the advancement staff, or for fundraising. Uh, and I would say that you know these results are just really impressive, particularly around the number of stories that were submitted. You know they definitely achieved their goal. They received so much content. Um, but also, I think the unique visits to the site is uh, particularly compelling, as well as their very high average time on page. So these results just scream success to me. So we are now ready to talk a little bit about timing, which is, in fact, not just important, but everything. Um, when you post. Um, so we're going to draw this back to the metaphor of uh, our wagons leaving Independence, Missouri at the right time. I don't know about where you guys are right now, but it is wickedly cold here in Ohio. Pretty sure the same thing is true in Vermont. If you leave too early <laughs> or too late, you will die in the depths of the cold, cold social media despair before you actually have the chance to live. And let me tell you, you actually want to live. So there are tons of studies about timing. I probably read at least one a day, and that's just, <laughs> that's a small number, actually. Um, I'm 
pretty quick to disregard them just because I want to think about audience first. I want to make sure that what we're doing is best for our audience, not because of research outside of our audience. But there is always truth to timing of the essence on social media. It will maximize your message if you time it well. Facebook's edge rank in particular hinges upon time and the decay of your content over time. So let's look at a couple uh, studies that have been published. Um, you know, remember that these studies aren't specific to the education industry, and I think my own would be the first to tell you that you need to take these studies with a grain of salt, find out what works for you, uh, and you know, you you will likely see plenty of engagement during time periods that are not suggested. But if you're looking for somewhere to start, you know, looking at this this study and the next one uh, are two pretty good places. So this Bitly. Uh, study was published May 8, 2012, and I think the key takeaway here is that you need, they're suggesting that posting in the afternoon will give you the highest engagement and click-throughs for both Twitter and Facebook. Our next study is from Buddy Media, and I have to say that this is uh, the study that I particularly like best. Uh, this, the, the data here was collected between December 11th, 2011 and February 23rd, 2012. So it was from a limited time period, but Buddy Media analyzed user engagement uh, from more than 320 Twitter handles of some of the world's biggest brands. And then they released these findings in June of 2012. So when I first saw this Steve, from uh, Buddy Media, I said to myself, Hmm, some of these suggestions actually make a lot of sense. You know, and, I, and I've implemented some of these ideas as I tweet for the various M. Stoner Twitter accounts, and I have seen success. Um, and the areas I've seen success particularly are making sure that I tweet roughly four times a day, but the key to that, I think, is you know, if you, if you tweet five or six times a day, it's not a big deal. It's not like you're going to all of a sudden lose engagement. I think their point is you don't need to tweet 20 times a day to see engagement. And so they've offered four as an optimal number. Um, and also, you know, I thought it was interesting. They're suggesting they don't pack in too many hashtags in one tweet. And certainly, you know, I have I have seen those tweets where every hashtag and its brother is listed on the tweet, and it it muddles the actual content that it's being sent out. And so I thought that that was a really great suggestion as well. Um, one other piece here is I've followed their suggestion about tweeting on weekends, and I've seen some really great traffic and interactions when I do. So uh, you know, sometimes because we're working eight to five, you know, that when we tweet, um, thinking about scheduling tweets for the weekends or actually just tweeting on weekends, you know, makes a lot of sense. We'll actually talk about scheduling a little later. The next slide is going to talk about Facebook and the, their uh, findings from Facebook. They actually surveyed 18,000 Facebook pages from April to May uh, in 2012. And so the data was collected over those two months and then published in June. What I think is interesting here is that Buddy Media is advocating for us to tell our fans what we want them to do with our posts. It's saying, you know, tell your fans to share a post or tell your fans to like or comment on a post and you will see more likes or comments, more shares. You know, funny how that works. Um, but I, th I thought that was a pretty interesting takeaway here. So, um, one last thing actually about that before we go on to my next Oregon Trail slide. Um, Facebook has changed all of their algorithms again, much like they do all the time. Um, and there is anywhere between a 25 and 50 percent decrease in the amount of reach that you may have any time that you post. So for many people this is a time to get more creative or it's a time to start thinking about um, paying for better placement um, before you get sucked down the rabbit hole of all the things that Facebook could be doing for you, think about what you can do for your audience first before you can think about the tools that you're going to try and use for it. Um, we have not approached the possibility of sponsoring posts yet for a ruling college. It may become necessary in the future, but I am continuing forward, hoping that the good stuff reaches the good people along the way.
So with a grain of salt. Uh, speaking of Facebook, speaking of the things that we post, we are going to talk about our content arsenal. What do you have to fill your social media calendar? In all of the cases that I'm going to bring up here, think about how you can make this content more social. If there is a human element involved, if people are interested in what you're talking about, you can enhance that element of it. So we will start with nostalgia, which is a personal favorite of mine. Um, this includes things like old photographs, information about favorite professors, spots on campus, or moments in campus history. Facebook really wanted people to work with this when they released their um, timeline feature last year. Uh, I had a great deal of fun doing research for that, but I learned something very important along the way. And this is a warning that I will gift to the rest of you. Uh, a lot of archive offices are actually wary of what happens online with their content. Think very, very hard about what terms of service are for um, images on any social platform you choose to use. Um, so for us, this means that we actually started thinking more creatively about what it took to share old photographs and quotes and anything else. Um, with that grain of salt there, um, nostalgia is excellent because it will connect um, informers and teams back to each other. Talking to older alumni, they will help connect you with the information that you need. Um, so what else do we have? We have big things that will keep us moving. The big things are things on campus that are always going to be hits on social media because people are already tuned in. And this includes things like big visitors, big events, and big days. So for us, these are orientation and move-in and graduation, which also for us um, overlaps with our reunion weekends as well. We consider place things like homecoming, any sort of campus tradition days, uh, and yeah, anything in between. Uh, next, things that are vital. Um, this includes information, uh, specifically things that are closing, things that are opening, or big changes in general announcements. Things that are useful. Uh, favorite engagement activities and fun for all ages. And this can be anything, but specifically I like to do stuff that has to do with our campus, um, collecting advice for students and pooling useful but subjective information. Where's the best place to eat pizza on campus might have 17 different responses, but it starts to build community around your campus, even if people are not present. And then last but not least, things that you might need to pull out if you're having a hard time. Things that might be easy, but on topic for your audiences. Things like weather, which will always work, um, campus beauty shots, and as we mentioned before, nostalgia. So Webster University found their bunny with the summer ticket giveaway. So as my mom was just saying, you know, what do you do when there's a content dry spell like in the summer? Well, Webster's global marketing communications team said, let's get tickets to concerts throughout the summer that are taking place in St. Louis. So they secured 200 tickets and their campaign utilized Foursquare, Twitter, and YouTube. Each channel provided participants a different way to win concert tickets. Their target audience was prospective and current students roughly between 16 and 35 years old that live within 90 miles of St. Louis and use social media. They too had clear objectives or goals for the campaign and they aligned those goals with the university's strategic plan. The first was to build brand awareness using social media. The second, to increase engagement among the university community. And the third, to drive traffic to the Webster University website. You can see this is the site that they created for the summer ticket giveaway. And these results, I, I think were, you know, they were impressive for the fact that they had a very limited target audience and you have to remember that you know if you're looking at this and saying well why didn't they get 18,000 mentions well they they had a very defined target audience here so these results uh, worked the results also helped Webster see which social channels work best with those target audiences obviously Twitter was the most successful of the three um, but the fact that they did receive one video submission uh, from one of the folks trying to get a ticket, you know, that's, that's really great too, but clearly Twitter is where their efforts uh, moving forward should be spent. 
They also measured traffic coming from these social channels to their blog server in June and July. And it's really impressive the numbers that they saw. In 2010, they received 230 visits. In that same time period in 2011, they received 2,476 visits. Their unique visitors went up uh, similarly from 125 in 2010 to over 1,300 unique visitors in 2011. And during the June-July time period in 2010, the page views were only at 747, and they increased to nearly 5,000 page views in June and July of 2011. So those, you know, those changes showed um, that they were very successful by setting up that landing page on their site. So uh, change, it is time to change. Uh, change is good. We're going to first consider our change in pace. So how frequently do you do things? You're, so we've talked a lot about timing already, but as I am quick to re-mention, um, your audience should define uh, how often you do things, which also will help you figure out what you should be posting, not just when, but what. Uh, pacing is also a time to think about short and long-term plans with social media. Um, an integrated way of communicating is really important. Um, for me, I balance big picture things that you already know that can be planned weeks ahead of time with flexibility. Um, and short-term plans of content for the week as well. So big picture things for me um, look a little bit like we already know that every year we have a commencement and an orientation and a homecoming weekend and all the other big events. So we can start planning for that way ahead of time every year. Um, short-term plans are more of the day-to-day. -day. This includes things like um, uh, articles that are coming out on our website, uh, possible on-campus activities that are of interest to other people, and everything else. And the best way to keep track of all of that is with a social media calendar. I love social media calendars because you can always plan ahead. You can always make a schedule for yourself for the content you want to post, content you know that's going to happen, holidays, for example, or if you have a week with wiggle room, a calendar can really keep you on track and keep you active in your various social channels, especially if you're managing more than one. So I also would recommend uh, adding notes for the changes and approaches to each social channel. If you create a calendar or even um, if it's in, say, a Google Doc, have separate tabs for separate channels because obviously messaging is going to be a bit different for each based on your platform's constraints. So a calendar will definitely help save you time. Something else that will help save you time is scheduling posts. And there's a good way to do it and a bad way to do it. The key is do not ignore or forget if you schedule posts. I suggest posting at similar times to help you remember. For example, I might schedule a tweet with an article from our blog from the at M Stoner Inc. Twitter account every day at 10 a.m. for the next month. I can get all those tweets scheduled probably within 10 to 15 minutes and then I am set. I've got at least one tweet going out every day with really great content and I know it's going out at 10 a.m. So I'm not going to forget and if people retweet or interact with that, um, I will know to pay attention because I know what time it's gone out. I also like to preset calendar alerts or reminders on days when I need to load no, new posts in, and that just helps you know, keep me on track. Of these here listed, um, I, the one I want to highlight is Buffer. I really like Buffer. I use it to schedule tweets for the ED Universe Twitter account. It makes it really easy for me to schedule a large number of tweets Quickly. And what, what's even better, and of course I've talked about numbers for about half the time I've talked on this webinar, um, so it probably won't surprise you to hear me say that I like Buffer because it gives me solid analytics. And then I can, you know, take a look at those analytics and determine if I need to switch up my timing or my style, you know, which, which tweets at which time tend to get, 
you know, the most retweets or click-throughs, you know, and Buffer provides that for you, and uh, it's free, so that's, that's even better. Um, I also like the reports that Sprout Social provides, and this tool also works really well for me because I manage multiple accounts. Um, I just want to put in a second plug for Buffer. I started using it because of Mallory, and I'm really, really enjoying it both for myself and for um, one of the Twitter accounts that I manage. So props for Buffer. Um, so uh, we're going to continue on the path of change. We're going to talk a little bit about our change in rations. Uh, sometimes you will go into overdrive when there's uh, live events or larger efforts happening on campus. Sometimes you have a dry spell when there's not a lot of content to share, especially during the summer. We saw that with the Webster U uh, example. Overall, you can stay on an even keel and keep your audience sated while not completely altering your schedule. So for me, I'm a social media manager. How frequently do I do things? This is a mock-up generally of what my social media management calendar looks like for me. And you're going to notice that I'm not doing it 24-7 or even eight hours a day. Um, I spend about a half an hour in the morning posting and catching up with anything that happened while I wasn't at my computer. Um, just to keep myself sane, I actually don't usually check our social channels in the evenings unless I've made a point to do so. Uh, it just keeps me a little bit more okay with doing it every single day all the time and gives me that uh, mental time away from it as well. Um, so that hour in the morning kind of gets me back on track again. And then from that point on, um, I check in about five minutes or so every hour or two hours, a little less so as the day goes on, just so I have a little more time to work on bigger things in the afternoon. Um, so you can also see that I have a content meeting, which is our ed weekly editorial meeting, where we talk about stuff that's upcoming both in the coming weeks and also in the coming semester that we need to keep an eye on. This is actually when I start planning my editorial calendar for the week, um, when I'm going to post stuff and where, and to what audiences it might be relevant. Um, and on Fridays, I tend to start looking into anything that I might be using the coming week. I do spend about an hour a week looking at our analytics. Um, that's a combination of Facebook insights, some uh, Twitter analytics, uh, we posts and we blogs on our Tumblr account and analytics for the Overland blogs, which have posts generally every week from our student employees. Um, we actually had a question come in via email asking a question about this precisely. Um, it's a big challenge when it comes to planning and executing because you are a one person department in a position that your institution has never had before. So constant and engaging content also needs to help develop strategic planning and metrics. I feel you, person via email, um, this is possibly the most challenging thing I had to learn how to balance when I started in this position as well. Um, my social media management position came after a year's communications fellowship here, and I was spending about half my time in that fellowship doing social media work and spending the rest of the day doing other things and keeping things balanced and ready to go. I actually have a pretty uh, crazy looking workflow. You can't see my laptop right now, but I have spaces set up for each thing I'm working on. And one of them is just social media management. Um, one of them is dedicated to email and one is dedicated to whatever project I'm on at that time. So I can kind of keep things straight because they're not bombarding me all the time. But I do have that little mental check of you should go back to this every hour or so just to see what's developed if something has a question that needs to be answered or anything. So um, that's how I do things. Uh, Mallory actually found some cool folks who were willing to share their breakdowns as well, and she's going to share them with you now. Yeah, before we hop into that, you know, there's been some really great chatter in the back channel around scheduling. And a few people have brought up that, you know, Facebook doesn't always like scheduled posts. Um, in terms of showing the post or in terms of the ranking. And, uh, you know, we didn't mention, but you can schedule Facebook posts in Facebook. And so if you use a third party app, um, the third party apps I was speaking about, I use primarily for Twitter. So I should have made that distinction. Um, Buffer and Sprout Social, I use, you know, solely for Twitter updates. Um, so if you're going to schedule Facebook in Facebook, you're going to be okay. So I just wanted to address that really quickly because everybody's talking about it on the back channel. Everyone's talking on the back channel. It's really great. So 
So let's talk about, uh, you know, these next few slides. If 60 minutes or less, I would have to say, beyond all the num slides, these are my next favorite in the presentation. Um, there are four awesome women who manage social media accounts for different institutions, and they are going to show us how they manage social media in 60 minutes or less each day. Our first fabulous woman is Courtney Mallam. She's the coordinator of print and new media at Glendon campus of York University. Glendon's a bilingual college located in Toronto, Canada. So she's our friend to the north. They have a social media presence on six channels, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, WordPress, FormSpring, and Instagram. And Courtney works in student recruitment. So her primary goal is connecting with prospects, but her role will often overlap with the current campus community as well. She's also the only social media manager on campus. So you can see how she's going to break down her day, uh, you know, spending a good portion of her time checking posts and responding to them on both Facebook and Twitter, um, Facebook pages and class pages. So that's about how she's spending nearly half of her time is actually responding and, and talking and communicating with people. And then she spends the other half of her time in making sure she's paying attention to her analytics and her goals, uh, you know, taking a look at what's going on on campus that would be relevant to her audience and managing the e-ambassador team, which is uh, their student online blogging team. Our next slide is going to show you what Megan Bernier does at St. Lawrence University. St. Lawrence is a, a liberal arts university in Canton, New York. They have a social media presence on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube and they are also looking at Instagram and Google+. Meg, as the writer, the university writer in the university communications office, is responsible primarily for content on the web in admissions and alumni publications as well. So social media is certainly not her full-time job here, but it's become her responsibility since last summer. And she's working on putting together a social media council on campus that will include people who are responsible for social, medias and social media channels in their respective offices. So she spends a good amount of her time, you know, paying attention to the channels that she is supposed to be creating content for and interacting with people. Again, I think that that is a theme that you'll see. You know, if you have an hour or less a day, making sure you carve out a good portion of that day to uh, check the accounts post and respond to posts um, so that those accounts are active and, and you are providing good customer service. Um, that's definitely a theme throughout these slides. Donna Talarico at Elizabethtown College uh, is the integrated marketing manager who is in the Office of Marketing Communications. And in addition to managing their official college social media accounts, she also handles web content and creative writing for print pieces for a variety of campus clients. Um, who work with the Office of Marketing and Communications. So she has a lot of stuff on her plate, but she has found she can successfully manage the social media accounts that they use, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, their blog, in less than 60 minutes. And on top of what you see on the screen, Donna also takes about 10 to 15 minutes to look at analytics once a week and spends roughly 30 minutes actually blogging for their social media blog. And our last example is Ann White, who is formerly the web communications coordinator at Oklahoma Christian University. They, uh, during her time there, they, Oklahoma Christian University was using Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, Vimeo, YouTube, and the campus community blog. She primarily focused on Facebook and Twitter, so I want to make that distinction. She was not in charge of all of those accounts, but primarily Facebook and Twitter. And she really sought to produce content that was interesting to all of the audiences, prospective students, current students, alumni, and community, because she was really the only person um, working with Facebook and Twitter at the time. OK. We are back on the trail again. Um, we're going to take a moment to look at the map. Um, so whenever you are traveling on this social media trail, 
it's always great to stop and take a look around at the bigger picture. Are you reaching goals? Should you adjust these goals? What can you share with the world about your accomplishments thus far? Um, every month or so, I do a check-in for myself that usually involves reviewing recent content, not just ours, but sp uh, supporting social media efforts from around the school, and I blog about it. This will elevate what we're doing to a different level. We are not just doing it for ourselves, we are doing it in the context of others as well. So, uh, one of my favorite things is talking to people. Um, when I say this, I mean talking to the people who are supporting your institution's story. They're not necessarily in line with what you are doing, but they are aligned to help you tell your grander story. So actually our example comes from Oberlin, which is a uh, blog that I have such a great time following both as a social media coordinator and also as someone who just really loves art. This is the official blog of the Allen Memorial Art Museum, which is our campus art museum here at Oberlin. It is cons consistently recognized as one of the top five uh, best college and art sorry, college and university art museums in the US. They jumped on the social media bandwagon back in 2009 by launching their museum blog on Tumblr way before any of us even thought about what Tumblr was or what it did. So the Allen is now a regular feature on Tumblr's museum spotlight. Um, they've amassed well over 7,000 followers since their inception in 2009, and they support Oberlin's mission of spreading the arts throughout the world with every single post they make. So as you can tell, they try and actually um, tie into relevant things that may be happening in the world. The post that you see here was their most recent one, which they did on Monday for Martin Luther King Day. And this is a sketch that's actually in our collection. So it's, it was a great thing to see that day. I don't, it didn't actually follow up to see how many posts or um, we blogs or likes that they got on this, but still it was a great thing to see on my dashboard that morning. So uh, we are now to another one of my favorite points, attempting to trade. This is professional development, kind of like we're doing right now. Um, there are numerous conferences, hashtags to track, Twitter chats, and additional resources out there. Um, we are going to, these are some of the hashtags that I follow regularly. Um, Case SMC has a bi-monthly chat about advancement in higher education, specifically surrounding social media. Higher Ed Live has a weekly web show, plus their affiliates of Student Affairs Live and Admissions Live. Mallory will tell you more about that stuff. And Community Manager Chat, which is every Wednesday at 2 p.m. It is not um, higher education specific, but they do an excellent job of bringing together managers from all over the place to talk about challenges, tips, and tricks. So follow edu is a searchable directory of Twitter users in higher ed. It allows users to sign in with their Twitter account, create an account within the site, and then list uh, their profile under certain interests, whether it is a specific hashtag like we're showing on the screen or a conference. So it, the point of the site is to allow you to connect with people easier, and I find it particularly useful around hashtags and conferences, um, especially if you're going to a new conference that you haven't been to before. Um, this can be a really great way to find some folks ahead of time and, and start connecting with them. The next slide is ED Universe. Uh, it is a hub where professionals can, uh, higher ed professionals can share thought leadership, um, find inspiration, build your network. You know, full disclosure, um, M. Stoner did create this site last February, but the site is really for those of us who work in and with higher education and know that the best way to help our community get smarter is to share our ideas and insight and inspiration with each other. So there's a really strong community value here. It's what ED Universe is all about and I am just blown away blown away by the really smart people who have joined uh, ED Universe over the last year. We have nearly 700 contributors on this site. That's eduniverse.org. And then of course there's Higher Ed Live. Uh, which is a live weekly web show that is exclusively focused on higher ed. 
there are three channels, Higher Ed Live, Student Affairs Live, and Admissions Live. If you go to higheredlive.com, you can see when each channel broadcasts. Um, each episode features interviews with industry-leading stars from colleges and universities across the country. Tonight's episode, a little shout out, is going to be hosted by Joel Goodman. Uh, it's focused on work hacks and getting stuff done. And it's at 7 o'clock Eastern tonight. Uh, Joel Goodman will bring on guests Ron Bronson, Tanya Oaksmith, Jeff Stevens, and Susan Raglan. And I also, I wasn't planning to do this, but I'll shout out next week's episode too because a couple people have tweeted and asked questions about crisis communications and how do you respond to that with social media and that could be a webinar in and of itself and it's actually the focus of next week's Higher Ed Live show which will be next Thursday January 31st at 7 p.m. Uh, Chris Syme is going to be the guest host and she is just super talented when it comes to dealing with this stuff. I tweeted out a link to some of her articles a few minutes ago, um, and I definitely recommend if you're interested in anything related to crisis communications to watch that episode next week at 7 p.m. And then our last resource is Higher Ed Solo, which uh, Ron Bronson and Tanya Oaksmith, who will be on Higher Ed Live tonight, they are the authors of this site. It's all about one-person shops in higher education, which I imagine if you are on this webinar, there's a good chance you identify as a one-person shop in higher education. So they have a really great post, and they've been doing a lot of uh, Q&A live interviews, and they will record them and post it on the site. So there's some with Eric Stoller and, and um, some other folks who, actually, I believe Courtney Mallon was recently interviewed, too. She, she was on our slides a few slides ago from uh, Glendon. I believe that she's on there as well, and, and some other people who are just doing some really great things, you know, as a one-person shop in higher ed. All right. Well, we have made it through our webinar, and it is 2.57, and I know some people probably have a hard stop at 3 o'clock. So before we get into Q&A, I want to share with you the super exciting thing that we announced that we give away at the beginning of the webinar. Um, so for those of you who stuck with us, I hope you remember the very first case study we talked about today from Florida State University, The Great Give. We have actually packaged up that chapter from Social Works, and we will send it to everyone who completes the post-webinar survey after you log out of GoToWebinar. So we don't leave yet. We're still going to do Q&A. But the survey that you'll be presented with when you do log out is very short, and it will provide Mayan and me with really important feedback about what you liked or didn't like about today's webinar. So I'm going to thank you in advance for taking that survey. And when you do, we will send you the sample chapter early next week. So we are just really thrilled to be able to offer people who attended this webinar that chapter. Um, it is the first time anyone is ever going to see it, and uh, I hope you're excited about that too. But let's hop into Q&A. Mayan, what do we have here? Oh gosh, we have so many. I've been trying to keep track. If for some reason I, we don't reach your question, I will be tweeting at you later, I promise. I've been trying to mark down the ones that I saw along the way. Um, so we had a question about where we should spend our time uh, following new followers, finding new followers or improving engagement with current followers. Um, I actually subscribe to the making what you're doing for the people that you already know there better and people will want to join that community. Um, we do not actively seek out new followers on any of our social sites, but we try and make it as welcoming a place as possible so anyone can join us there. So. Um, we hope that the new followers find us rather than us trying to find them. Uh, we had another question about what is the best way to reach out to current students to remind them of deadlines, etc., on a separate Facebook page or the main university page? Who is the main audience? Um, sorry, I guess that was a continuation. Whose main audience is prospective and current students with some alumni? Uh, don't spend too much time spamming prospectives with current student information. Um, I have no good answer to this because, as you pointed out, your audience is um, very specific on what page you currently have. For us, our main university Facebook page is almost entirely alumni. We have a page dedicated to our prospective students who are welcome to ask 
questions of us, but we actually don't see very much activity there. We get more interactions from prospective students on our Tumblr blog or on the Oberlin College blogs than we do on any of the other social sites we have. So for me, I, I don't know how to answer that just because it, it very much depends. If you find that your audience that you're trying to reach happens to be there, speak to them and everyone else will just appreciate that you're um, connecting people with the information that they need at that time. You know, Mayan, I when I read this question about reaching current students uh, on social media to remind them of deadlines, part of me wonders if, if social media is actually the best channel to reach those students to remind them of those deadlines. Also it seems true. like, you know, I'm not sure what institution the person who asked that question is from, but, uh, you know, in my experience, maybe it's offline channels that mm -hmm. will be most effective or email. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not positive that social media is actually the best way to do that. Uh, yeah. But you know, again, that's something that I think each institution has to answer for themselves. Yes. Uh, Mayan, we had a question before the webinar because some people sent us questions, and we really appreciate that um, via Twitter. This person was seeking tips to increase their followers. And they have a very specific audience, and, and they were looking for tips to increase followers. And actually, during the webinar, I noticed a few people were talking about uh, whether or not you should focus on increasing followers or engagements. And I have to say that one of my favorite tweets from today's webinar was from Tiffany Brabe at the College of William & Mary. She responded to that question by saying, in my opinion, the answer is increasing engagement. 100 people engaged is way better than 10,000 disinterested fans. The commenting, the liking, the sharing will provide the reach. And then she exclaimed, yeah. <laughs> and I love that. Did, did you have anything to add to that? Um, I agree with that completely. Um, the only thing that I have to add to it is knowing that you can pay to have your follower numbers increase. It is a in my mind, that is a false sense of hope. You can, I actually, we had a, um, a message pop up on our Oberlin Conservatory Facebook page this morning saying, for $10 a day, you can increase your followers. And I immediately looked at it and said, why do I want to increase my followers? Because a number of people involved with our page may be useful, but I'm more interested in engaging the ones who are already there so other people feel like they can become involved as well. Mayan, we also had a question um, via email before the webinar from someone who works at a smaller institution and has very limited resources and is wondering if it's better to have one main Facebook page or if they should split into multiple pages for the university for alumni, different schools or colleges, etc. What, what do you think about that? Uh... I, I, I have many thoughts, but I will, I will distill them for the purposes of right now. Um, when staffing resources are limited, um, perhaps the best way to do things is to begin to include people as the need arises. So um, when I read this question, I interpreted it as, should we decide to create pages for everything? Uh, I would not straight up go out there and try and make it all happen now. I wouldn't go out and start individual pages pages for all of the offices and departments on Oberlin's campus. But should the need arise that an office or a department wants to be connected on Facebook or have a page or an account somewhere else on social media to figure out why precisely they want to use social media and then figure out where the best place for them to be is. That was an interestingly parsed sentence. Um, <laughs> but yes, um, it's possible that one singular account won't get the job done, but it's not a cue to start pages for everything. It's possible that reorganizing information on your website, making something more accessible on a current page that already exists, could solve the problems that you already are seeing come up. So um, that wasn't actually a great answer to that question, but I usually, when getting a question about um, needing a Facebook page or another similar social account, um, take about three steps back and start thinking about why it is we want to connect socially with our audiences and then figure out who precisely we're trying to talk to. And then from that point, figure out where it needs to go. 
Nice. I like that. We just got a question in through the control panel. How do you increase likes and engagement with a Facebook page that's been dormant for a while, and how do you stir up interest in it again? And my suggestion would be, you know, just post things that people care about. You know, you, of course you could do something like a sponsored post or a paid ad, but really um, the best strategy is going to be your content strategy. And the key is, you know, we we were just talking about this. Is it is it getting more followers or getting more followers who actually care about you and certainly the answer is the latter. So figuring out how you're going to reach your target audience and, and stir up that interest again, you know, might start by saying, well, what are what are the goals for the actual page? You know, who are we trying to stir up interest with and why? What do we want them to do? Um, it could be as simple as, you know, if you have the opportunity to promote that Facebook page on certain certain places throughout the website. Um, again, you know, I like an integrated marketing strategy too, and, and this is going a little bit larger than just social media now, but um, integrating other forms of communication to share about the fact that you have that Facebook page, uh, you know, definitely don't overlook the value in that. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, walking, it's, it could be as simple as walking around the cafeteria <laughs> and putting little, uh, you know, flyers on the tables to remind people that your page exists. You know, that, that might work at your institution. It might not work if you're totally commuter, you know, but if you're a residential institution, that might work. So thinking about uh, some creative ways to stir that up, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, actually, from a from an Overland perspective, all of our social channels list the other social channels that we have, so nice. we can complete the loop everywhere. If you're on our Facebook page and have a Twitter account, you can find that. If you're on our Tumblr page and think that our blogs are cool, you can go to that as well. So there's kind of a way to connect the dots back to every single thing that we're doing here already. We're kind of keeping people in the loop of Overland if they visit our sites. Nothing is standing on their own um, and that's a pretty cool thing um, I have one more question that we saw before um, again if you had questions and I didn't see them I'll just answer everything on Twitter later I'll be there for the rest of the day um, we had a question about scheduling posts to Facebook using Hootsuite or rank lower by Facebook than regular posts um, I personally found that to be the case when I started using Hootsuite about a year and a half ago and just stop using it entirely. Um, I'm not sure if the algorithms have actually changed uh, because the um, every algorithm has changed with Facebook recently. For me, I would rather play exactly by Facebook's rules with the things that we already know will work. So I actually post manually on Facebook every day when I do it. I don't schedule things. I will. I will play by their rules for right now. Um, it will make our lives easier. It makes gaming their system a little less terrifying because we are doing it exactly the way that they would like us to do it. Um, I recognize that uh, Hootsuite and other things are actually incredibly useful for Twitter and am trying to move back into the model of doing that again just to make sure that everything comes back to um, our original account. I've been Playing with new Twitter clients all the time, it's a it's kind of a hobby of mine, unfortunately. So yeah, I'm not sure. Um, most outside third-party apps for Facebook are negatively impacted by algorithms. Um, and since Facebook is actually the only social platform out of all of these that we've even mentioned today, um, it is based on algorithms rather than opting in to see communications. Uh, if you've liked it, Facebook page, it does not mean that you're going to see all of the information from it. And that is an incredibly frustrating thing at times, but it's also a uh, unique opportunity to try and think about what other platforms are out there that people who have decided they're interested in talking to you will see the things that you post. I think that's it. We've gone 10 minutes over and I can't thank everyone enough for sticking with us this whole time. Um, and again, just a reminder, if you'd like that sample chapter, all you've got to do is fill out the survey when you log off. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Tweet at us if you had more questions and continue using the Ford River hashtag. For me, it stands for innovation and people doing cool things. So please do it. Please keep on doing that.
Awesome. And so we will likely be reprising this webinar next week for anyone who wasn't able to get in. So if you know somebody who you think uh, would enjoy listening to the session, uh, just shoot us an email, mallory.wood at mstoner.com, and I'll make sure to include them on the invite. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. It was great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.